one of the things that I am working on is developing a uh, novel devices that can measure what I call vagal efficiency. I think we looked at vagal tone and we didn't, uh, basically people bought in and didn't ask the real question. And that is how much good is it doing you? <laughs> so, so in a sense, uh, is the vagal break working? Is it effectively regulating your heart rate? Uh, you might have a strong vagal break, so it looks like it's good, but does it uh, uh, go on and off dynamically to enable your heart rate to regulate and calm down? So it's like you get destabilized and you have a break, but is the break now coming on or is it destabilized? So when you exercise, do you calm down rapidly or do you not? Mm -hmm. So I developed a metric called vagal efficiency, and I'm now working with the same company that actually is distributing uh, the safe and sound protocol to create this device where people can literally monitor and evaluate this vagal efficiency. We're finding out that many individuals who carry diagnoses of dysautonomia, meaning the autonomic nervous system isn't working right, it pops up in this vagal efficiency. And we know that trauma uh, downregulates vagal efficiency, and we know that diseases of dysautonomia do as well. So we know we have a hint, and I really would like to see this I, I want to see a large database. Now, the safe and sound protocol was really, I would say, a, uh, a theoretical uh, experiment. It was like saying, can based on what we know about the polyvagal theory, and we know about the neural regulation of middle-ear structures, and we know that when people have uh, disorders of the nerves that control the middle ear muscles, that they become hypersensitive to sound. Bell's palsy is your natural experiment, which is a, a lateralized paralysis of the facial nerve. But the facial nerve also controls the one of the middle ear muscles, the stapedius. And one of the symptoms of Bell's palsy is hypersensitivity. So we know that that is a phenomenon. The question is, can you uh, send a cue to the nervous system uh, that there is safety in the vocalizations and will the nervous system now in a sense meet it halfway? The bottom line here is that when we're under threat, we want to hear low frequency sounds because that is the basically the evolutionary story. Um, when we're under threat, we, we evolved as very from very small mammals that really were populated the earth when reptiles were the dominant uh, species. And the mammals were basically food and reptiles produce, uh, their acoustic system detected low frequency sound because they didn't have middle ear bones. The middle ear bones broke off the jawbone in the transition to mammals. <clears throat> and that enabled mammals to have a frequency band that the reptiles could hear. And that became a frequency band of social communication based on the physics or size of the middle ear structures. So we have a frequency band that's wired into us that is where social communication occurs. It's a mother's lullaby. It's not a bass fiddle, it's a violin. So the mm -hmm. answer is that there are certain frequencies that we can say no to. Our nervous system says, I'm all yours. <clears throat> and then it reacts and it calms the body down. And this is what the Safe and Sound Protocol was doing, was saying we can create through the filtering of vocal music, we can amplify the intonation features that are in the frequency that your body can't say no to. And this was working really great with children on spectrum and individuals with auditory hypersensitivities. But, you know, my footprint was in the world of trauma. So people in the world of trauma wanted to try this. And I was very excited to see what would happen. Uh, and often there would be a therapist who is a trauma therapist with a trauma history uh, uh, herself or himself, and they would try it at home. It says break the rules of signals of safety in isolation as opposed to signals of safety with a safe companion. And they would get adverse reactions, meaning they would get very anxious, very mobilized. They would have bodily feelings. But what it was doing was their body calmed down and they became 
accessible, but not accessible really. They became vulnerable. So we mm-hmm. have to understand that when we are healthy and our nervous systems work, accessibility is where we want to be. But if we have a trauma history, that opening up of this ventral area is vulnerability. So when the body calmed, it became vulnerable and closed off. And this really set off a cascade of interesting observations and treatment modifications. Because it told us that you could utilize the stimulus in a titrated manner. And you could move people into this experience and allow their bodies to resolve, very similar to the methodology embedded in somatic experiencing, titration, as Peter Levine calls it. Mm. But basically, in polyvagal terminology, you're challenging the nervous system and you're allowing it to recover. You're challenging it and you're allowing it to recover. And there have been some really remarkable, uh, I say, breakthroughs. And what people have said is that. It's an adjunctive therapy. It's not a therapy for trauma, but people who are trauma therapists, whether they're somatic experiencing or internal family systems, or there's several others, EMDR, there are actually a subset of practitioners in all these groups who are using the safe and sound protocol and building hybrid treatment models. And they all say it accelerates the treatment model, because it's functionally a state shifter. It calms the body down and enables them to do their work. And there's somatic therapists, body workers using it as well, in a sense, enabling the body to be more accessible. So on that point, and before before I let you go, when it comes to to the sounds that are being administered, yeah. are these sounds that a person can replicate within their own body, or is it has to, does it have to come out of a of a device? Uh, It comes out of a device because it takes sounds that humans make and then computer alters them. It basically amplifies processes. So if you think of music, vocal music as already being hyper prosonic, this just amplifies the frequency intonation changes. It is a patented procedure And my goal is to basically make it universal for all forms of music. But right now, it basically uses, I would say, canned music. But I want to make it as a dynamic system, meaning that people could listen to whatever they want, and this would process it. Then you go to the movies, you could watch cartoons, you could do whatever you want. And it's, it says, doing this dynamic filtering. That's huge. Where can people find more information on um, this? They can, uh, they can go to my webpage, stephenporches.com, and then they can click on the Safe and Sound Protocol, and it will send them to uh, uh, integrated listening systems.